thank Deb for reminding us of the power of that prayer. Jesus continues to set the stage for what McLaren calls his global uprising as he teaches his disciples. First, in this Sermon on the Mount, he told them how contrary to how they saw the world, that the meek, not the powerful, wouldn't be blessed, that the poor, not the mighty, would inherit the kingdom, that those who were persecuted, not their persecutors, would find mercy and hope. And then he took the law with all of its power and authority and said to his disciples, you need to be more righteous than even the law demands. You have heard it said, but I say to you, he declared, not just actions, but intentions will shape my followers. Not simply being good, but being righteous and merciful, filled with grace. These are the marks of the faithful. And then he turns, as we read today, to how to practice this new faith. What it means to work our lives in such a way that we can live this faith forward. Here's what Jesus says according to Matthew. Be careful that you don't practice your religion in front of people to draw their attention. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Whenever you give to the poor, don't blow your trumpet as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may get praise from people. I assure you that's the only reward they'll get. But when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that you may give to the poor in secret. Your father who sees what you do in secret will reward you. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners so that people will see them. I assure you that's the only reward they will get. But when you pray, go to your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is present in that secret place. Your Father who sees what you do in secret will reward you. When you pray, don't pour out a flood of empty words as the Gentiles do. They think that by saying many words, they will be heard. Don't be like them, because your Father knows what you need before you ask. Pray like this. Our Father who is in heaven, uphold the holiness of your name. Bring in your kingdom so that your will is done on earth as it's done in heaven. Give us the bread that we need for today. Forgive us for the ways we have wronged you, just as we also forgive those who have wronged us. And don't lead us into temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. If you forgive others their sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your sins. And when you fast, don't put on a sad face like the hypocrites. They distort their faces so people will know that they're fasting. I assure you, they have their reward. When you fast, brush your hair and wash your face. Then you won't look like you're fasting to people, but only to God, who is present in that secret place. Your Father who sees in secret will reward you. In our study book, Brian McLaren writes in response to that passage, all of us agree the world isn't what it should be. We all wish the world would change. But how? How can we change the world when we can hardly change ourselves? Isn't that what we want from our faith? To be changed? To change our community, to change our world, to see the justice and grace of God that we have found in Jesus making a difference all around us? So Jesus tells his disciples, before you head out to teach or to preach or to heal or to challenge, <coughs> excuse me, 
Hmm. It's with microphones. They're always in front of you. Uh, let me start that again. So Jesus tells his disciples, before you head out to teach or to preach or to heal or to challenge, first look inward. Dig deep. Prepare. And the word that we use to describe these means of interchange is the word practice. In that version that I just read a moment ago, it uses that word to set the stage. The first thing that Jesus says is, be careful that you don't practice your religion in front of people simply to draw their attention. Practice is the right word, I think. We need to hear Jesus telling us to practice, to learn, to prepare, to set ourselves on the journey of faith that is before us. Through prayer, through giving up that which might distract us, through learning the art of giving, through regular worship and fellowship, through all the ways that we can discover our connection to God. A writer by the name of Milton Brasher Cunningham, who is a writer, a minister, and also a chef, among other pursuits, he's one of those folks that does a lot of different things, has written a book called Keeping the Feast, where he compares cooking in a restaurant and the communion table. And he ties those together. I'm reading the book with my farm retreat group. And early in the book, he writes about becoming a chef. He says, I didn't go to culinary school. Instead, I came up through the ranks, starting as a dishwasher and then a prep cook, and was able to work my way up the cooking line because professional cooking is still a career where apprenticeship is an accepted and honored way to learn the craft. I love to cook, and I thought maybe I could do that for a living. I found a small place that was opening and bugged the chef every day for two weeks until he capitulated and hired me. And then over the next eight or nine years, I had a chance to work for and with some extremely talented and creative people who were more than willing to share their knowledge. I worked in restaurants ranging from a small breakfast place that taught me how to cook good eggs fast to fine dining restaurants where I was afforded ingredients like white truffle oil and fennel pollen. Over time, he writes, I have had a chance to hone my cooking skills. And he goes on a little later, he says, my favorite thing to cook is comfort food. The fancy ingredients are fun, but if I can make mashed potatoes that taste so good you will leave your potatoes in your vegetable bin at home and drive to eat my cooking, then I've done something special. I want to make food that makes you want to come eat with me. I want to make the kind of food that will make you remember our being together, the signature, the distinguishing mark of a great meal is in the memory it creates. And then he concludes that thought by writing, communion is the signature dish of our faith. Sharing the bread and the cup is at the core of who we are together. It is the meal around which we build our identity, our defining ritual. Later on, he picks up on that theme. He talks about ritual being meaningful repetition, something that you do over and over again, like, like making a good peanut butter sandwich. You know, you've you got to work on that, Deb said. You've got to learn how to do it so you can share it with somebody else. You repeat it over and over so that you know what you're doing. Repetition is a stacking of time, each experience laid on top of the other, so that over time you can come back to it again and again and learn from it. One of the stories of the Old Testament is Joshua telling the people of Israel to stack up the stones after they've crossed the Jordan so that in the years to come when they get back to the Jordan, the children can say, what are those stones for? And they'll have the opportunity once again to tell the story. God led us out with a mighty hand from Egypt and into the promised land. The repetition 
telling the story over and over again. Now, if ritual is meaningful repetition, then habit, I suppose, might be kind of an opposite. A repetition that grows out of convenience or maybe compliance or perhaps just because. Somewhere in life we have to just keep stacking up stones if life is going to mean something. And so Jesus said to his disciples when he first passed the bread and wine, he said, as often as you do this, remember me. As often as you do this, over and over again, I think Jesus was not so much envisioning a communion service at a, at a fine table or an altar with fancy communion ware as much as he was gathering around the kitchen table on a Sunday afternoon with family and breaking the bread once again and remembering that all of our meals might be rituals and not simply habits. Practice makes perfect. But even more, practice makes ritual. We do these things in secret in our everyday lives so that when we have need, we can enter into ritual, into those shaped and understood habits of behavior that carry us through. Albert Camus, the philosopher and playwright, wrote a long time ago, works of art are not born in flashes of imagination, but in daily fidelity. Did you hear that? Works of art are not born in flashes of imagination, but in daily fidelity. You work at it. How often do we hear about the latest musical superstar who appears on the scene, and then as people begin digging in, they hear the stories of the years and years that they played the little clubs, and they honed their craft, and they asked questions, and they learned what it means to do their task. Or the athlete who spends hours upon hours hours every day swinging a golf club or throwing a football or practicing that difficult move on a balance beam to be ready for that one moment in the spotlight. Works of art and the expression of talent and the power of faith do not come easily, but with practice. A few weeks ago, when we were celebrating the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. and then Black History Month, I was drawn back to the story of those civil rights activists of the 60s who prayed and practiced the work of nonviolence so that when the batons were swinging and the dogs were unleashed, they could stand their ground. They spent years of preparation and prayer, and that's what Jesus asks of us to prepare ourselves to be faithful. So how do we do it? Well, first, I think we focus less on that word secret and more on the word practice. Sometimes we read this lesson and we start feeling guilty because we prayed outside of our closet. And that's not what Jesus means. I think what Jesus wants from us is to master the art of faithful living in our everyday lives, in the ordinary moments, which really are relatively secret. We're not out in public all the time. So that when the time comes, when we're needed, we will be ready to live as he wants us to live. And so he tells us to fast, or to go without, to wait and watch in our lives, not to show someone else how faithful we are, but to prepare ourselves for times of trial. We give regularly and faithfully in the everyday moments of our lives so that we can hone the fine art of giving and practice an attitude of thankfulness for God. We gather for worship each week. We come to the table to break the bread and drink the cup, even when we don't particularly feel like it on that morning, so that we build up this deep reservoir of hope and courage for the inevitable trials of life. 
to gather in fellowship with other believers just to be together so that we do not become separated in times of strife or conflict so that the political demands of the world and the cries for justice and mercy and grace do not overwhelm us and we pray daily practicing the art the power of prayer in those quiet moments at a stoplight in the morning when we get up in the evening before we go to bed before our meals in those moments when we just have that opportunity to reflect back on what god would have us be we pray so that we will not be weak or wordless when god has something for us to do our father who is in heaven uphold the holiness of your name bring in your kingdom so that your will is done on earth as it's done in heaven give us the bread we need for today forgive us for the ways we have wronged you just as we also forgive those who have wronged us and don't lead us into temptation but rescue us from the evil one Our reward, Jesus says, comes from the practice of faith, not from the accolades of others, but the gift of God's presence with us each and every day. In the name of Christ, amen.